Buenos días a todos. Gracias, un año más, por estar aquí y compartir con nosotros el interés y la ilusión por analizar el sector energético y este año, como en realidad con un título u otro, siempre estamos intentando abordar cuáles son los retos del sector. Nos cabe el honor de tener como keynote speaker, en primer lugar, a Christopher Jones. Christopher Jones, como todo el mundo sabe, es director general adjunto de la Dirección General de Energía. Después de una muy larga trayectoria en la Comisión Europea, que comenzó en el año 85, con varios años dentro del de ámbito de competencia, incorporándose ya en el año 97 al ámbito de la Dirección General de Energía con responsabilidades en la Unidad de Electricidad y Gas y estuvo durante un tiempo largo en esa dirección, culminando en esa primera etapa en la Dirección General de Energía en el periodo del comisario Peebles, en el que Christopher Jones fue el responsable de la coordinación y el desarrollo estratégico de la política energética y del parte de la concepción, el diseño y la negociación del programa que es sobre el que convergen hoy todos los debates, que es el programa 2020. Posteriormente, siguiendo al comisario Peebles, ha estado hasta, hasta un tiempo en, en la Comisaría de Desarrollo para volver a la Dirección General de Energía en el puesto que ahora ocupa. Déjenme, además de hacer referencia a estos, este currículum, este brillante currículum de Christopher Jones, señalar que es un jurista de referencia en todos los ámbitos del derecho comunitario y tiene una amplia relación de publicaciones sobre las cuales no me puedo detener, dado que es eh, enormemente larga, pero sí le puedo decir que para los juristas que se ocupan de los temas comunitarios, especialmente de energía, el, los libros, y uno en particular de Christopher Jones, eh, está siempre a mano de los que tienen que trabajar sobre este tema. Christopher Jones es un excelente jurista que comienza su, carre, su carrera tras eh, su graduación en Reading y después eh, en un máster eh, en la misma Universidad de Reading y después en el Colegio de Brujas. Y además, permítanme decir, decirles que a nivel personal, además de mis responsabilidades en función de la cátedra, es un placer tener aquí Christopher Jones, que es un buen amigo. Muchas gracias, Christopher. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you to Fonsiem for this very, very kind invitation. Um, to understand where European energy policy is going to go, you have to understand its origins. You have to understand where it's come from. And that, in fact, was just almost 10 short years ago, 2005. Before 2005, there was not really a European energy policy. There was some legislation on oil stocks. There was a renewable energy directive that asked member states to set their own targets. But there was not really a European energy policy. But then in 2005, we faced three key challenges. The first is we had committed a 20% CO2 cut for Kyoto, and we had to agree how to implement that. Secondly, we had Gazprom, Russia, cutting off our gas supplies via the Ukraine, and we had the problem that our energy prices were higher than those in the United States or China or elsewhere. Now, 
Of course, those three characteristics are very similar to the challenges that we're facing today. And that, at the end of the day, is the point. So faced with these three challenges, Kyoto, competitiveness, and energy security, the European heads of state asked the Commission to put out a new energy policy for Europe, as it was called. And so from that gave birth to the 2020-20 targets, a 20% cut of CO2 by 2020, a 20% objective of renewable energy in our energy mix by 2020, and a 20% increase in energy efficiency. And so on that basis, the heads of state accepted those three key challenges, the 2020, which is still the bedrock of our energy policy up till 2020. And then they asked the Commission to put through a series of policies to make this a reality. And that was based on, if you like, let's say seven, seven pillars. Firstly, the internal energy market. Between 2007 and 2012, we had the second, we had the third internal market package, which brought the liberalization and the structure of the market as we are today. We created the ASA um, regulatory agency. We had national regulators. We had the unbundling. It changed the face of the European utilities industry forever. We had the Renewables Directive, the first real Renewables Directive, whereby we set legally binding targets for renewables on each member state. We had priority dispatch for renewables. And interestingly enough, we allowed member states to have their own national support schemes. Now, we think 20% is perhaps not that much when we're looking at it back at it today. But remember, in 2009, when we started this directive, 20% of energy consumption in Europe we're talking about. We're not talking 20% of electricity. We're talking about 20% of European energy. And at that stage, we only had 8%, 8.5% renewables, of which 7% was large hydro. We're not doing any more large hydro. So in 2009, we had 1.5% renewables, and we had to get to 20% renewables, which meant at the end of the day that we were going to do everything we had done in the past in terms of wind and solar every single year for another 11 years. So in fact, it was hugely ambitious at its time. We implemented the Energy Efficiency Directive with de facto a legally binding target on each member state. We had the Eco Design Directive with minimum standards for products. We had labeling for the goods that you now see in all of your stores where you buy pretty much everything. And you have building codes at the European level. We have an Energy Security Directive, the gas and electricity security of supply, risk preparedness. Um, we have the Infrastructure Directive, where we put 6 billion euros into infrastructure at the European level. And we have the Strategic Energy Technology Plan, and last but not least, the Emissions Trading System. Just, just going through that list, I'm almost exhausted at the thought of it, of what happened in just four or five years. And that was the basis. So everything that I've mentioned now has been the basis of the energy revolution that we have really seen in Europe and is now just beginning to really make itself felt. Now, when we started this energy revolution in 2009, we always said that the European energy revolution, I'm going to use this word quite often, was based on a triangle. That if you have to have a good energy policy, it has to be based on three equally important objectives. It has to be based on the objective of sustainability. Yep, absolutely. But it also has to be based on the objective of competitiveness and security of supply. So that European energy policy should be aimed at ensuring that this triangle is met. That we have to ensure that our energy policy hits sustainability, competitiveness, and security of supply. So let's look to see whether we have achieved this triangle. Because if we haven't achieved this triangle, we have failed ourselves, our businesses, and our citizens. Let's be fair. Okay? 
So, first of all, energy efficiency. Our policy on energy efficiency in terms of having the most efficient buildings, having the most efficient um, vehicles, having the most efficient computers, washing machines, and ensuring that energy efficiency becomes part of our daily lives because the energy that we don't use is the cheapest, most cost-effective, most job-creating source of energy that we can produce at the end of the day. And here, I would certainly argue that we are absolutely on track to meet this triangle of the three objectives because we are on track to meet the 20% improvement on energy efficiency. Our economy is much more competitive. And honestly speaking, we do have the gold standard in terms of energy efficiency legislation worldwide. I was in Tokyo uh, last week, and even in Japan, they are requesting our help in terms of improving their energy efficiency legislation. In terms of energy security, I would also argue that we are meeting this triangle, but much, much, much remains to be done. For example, we are in the process of breaking Gazprom's monopoly over Central and Eastern Europe. We are in the process of building the infrastructure necessary to ensure that the Baltics and Central Eastern Europe is fully connected to the rest of the European Union. And this is so important. This is so important. In 2015, Central Eastern Europe paid 24% more for the gas that it purchased from Gazprom than Central Western Europe, despite the fact that the molecules travel further to get to Central Western Europe. In 2015, so 2016, it was 16% less. So if Central Eastern Europe had had the same prices as Central Western Europe in 2015, 2016, they would have saved 3.2 billion euros. The total cost of infrastructure to really connect this region is only 4 billion euros. How difficult can this be? And we are in the process of achieving this. We will get a final investment decision on all the infrastructure necessary to give this region multiple gas suppliers by 2020. The same thing is in the Baltic region. Until a few years ago, the Baltics were completely dependent on Gazprom. We um, worked together in order to build the Klaipeda LNG terminal in Estonia. The day after it opened, Prices in the Baltic regions dropped 25%, and the terminal has paid itself back many times. So in terms of energy security, we are making progress. And when I talk about energy security, I need to talk about Iberia, as the minister did. Because when we're talking about the isolation, the relative isolation of Iberia, of Spain and of Portugal. We're not just talking about competitiveness. Yes, of course we're talking about competitiveness. Of course we're talking about the right and the obligation to ensure that every region of the European community can fully participate in the internal market. So it is about competitiveness, but it is also about security. In terms of electricity, it is so vital that both Biscay Bay and the Pyrenees are now rapidly constructed. This is not just a question of price, but of course it's a question of price when you have a price differential between Iberia and its neighbor. But it is, of course, a question of security, and it is a question of efficiency. It is so important when you have a renewable-based European market that you make maximum use of the different profiles of the electricity systems of neighboring markets. This should not be difficult. And we all know the difficulties in terms of Biscay Bay and in terms of the Pyrenees are not largely financial. They are planning and acceptability. And these must be overcome. In terms of MidCat, of course, this is in terms of 
competitiveness. Of course, this is in terms of ensuring the right of Spain's LNG terminals to compete with the rest of Europe. But it's also a question of competitiveness. It is a question of security. Nobody would design a market by which you are dependent on A, LNG, and B, Algeria. Uh, today, there is no problem at all. Algeria continues to ensure continued and full supplies, and we have every reason to expect that they will continue to do so. But we all know the effect of Fukushima, and the future is not predictable. Yes, we expect LNG to be very liquid, deeply competitive for the next best part of a decade, but we all expect the markets to be tightening up after that. So for all these reasons, part of energy security, and again, it is so linked to competitiveness, requires that progress is made on these. So in terms of energy security, and I'm linking infrastructure in the internal market, yes, we are meeting this triangle, but there's still a hell of a lot of work that may, needs to be done. Now, coming to something more difficult, renewable energy. We are meeting our target for renewable energy, 20% renewable energy in our energy mix. And it's important to unpick this. And remember, it's 20% renewables in the Europe's energy mix. When we think of 20% renew renewables, most of us think 20% electricity. No, 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 no. It's 20% renewables in our overall energy mix. And most of our energy is in transport and heating and building, heating and cooling of buildings. And getting renewables into heating and cooling of buildings and into transport is a hell of a lot more difficult than getting it into electricity in the short term. So at the end of the day, 20% renewable energy is going to mean 35% of our electricity in 2020 will be renewable. But it's 35% of our average renewable electricity, not 35% of our peak renewable electricity. So if you hit 35% of your average renewable energy, of course, when all your windmills are blowing and all your solar panels are shining or are working, you're going to get 70 and 80% or plus already with 35%. It's important to notice. Also, when the Renewable Directive was adopted in 2009, one of the main arguments is that this would give a huge boost to growth and jobs in Europe. Because we, it would enable, through cheaper technology, to bring prices down, it would create a lot of jobs in Europe. Well, we also accepted, the Court of Justice also accepted, that support schemes can be national in scope. Now, the European Union is based on the law of comparative advantages. You grow most of the tomatoes in Spain because you have a lot of sunshine in Spain. You make the luxury cars in Germany because the Germans happen to be particularly good at producing luxury cars. The law of comparative advantage is what underpins our internal market. However, for a product that is more determined by comparative advantage, it's evidently cheaper to use solar panels where you have sunshine, it's evidently cheaper to put windmills where there is a lot of wind, we have some not, somehow not done this in Europe. And in a way, what we have done makes as much sense as growing all the olives that Finnish people eat in greenhouses in Finland. Now, I'm not saying that this policy of permitting and allowing national support schemes is wrong, I'm just saying that when we look to the future, maybe it requires another examination. And the consequence of all these is today in Europe, we are spending 50 billion euros a year in renewable subsidies. And at the same time, through a combination of low ETS prices, low coal prices, we have negative coal uh, spark spreads for gas. So at the same time as spending 50 billion in euros for renewable subsidies, we're burning more gas than we have done before. And we're closing down brand new CCGTs. And so goes the argument, this kind of doesn't make sense when your objective is to decarbonize the economy. Next, we have low marginal costs, lots of renewables, feed-in tariffs, nuclear, which means that the wholesale prices 
for, in, for electricity have been going down and down and down, which means that there's been no incentives for new investment, which have led member states to produce capacity mechanisms, which have been limited to the member state level. So as a consequence of renewable support schemes at the national level and capacity mechanisms at the national level, we have been slowly, but not to a minor extent, renationalizing the internal energy market. Now, you might say, or you might think, that I've been presenting a very negative position regarding what we have achieved in renewable energy. I have not. What I have been trying to do is to undertake a fair and objective assessment of where we are. Yes, we have made great steps forward. We are achieving our 20%, but yes, it has come at a cost. But my main argument is that we should be deeply proud of this as Europeans. If we had not taken this courageous step, if we had not accepted this charge, the industrialization of renewable energy that we have seen would not have taken place. And the price reduction that we have seen for PV and for wind would not have occurred, or would not have occurred so quickly, and the commitments that we have had in Paris and the explosion in renewable energy across the world would not have happened as quickly as it does. So I believe that we should be deeply proud of what we have achieved. But I would also say what we have done in the past does not necessarily have to be the signpost for the future. So, our heads of state have made it very clear, absolutely clear, that our commitment to dealing with climate change is unequivocal. It is amongst if not the greatest challenge of our generation. And now we have new objectives to meet in the context of the Paris Agreement. So the 202020, where we started in 2009, has already become something more ambitious. It has become a 40% cut of CO2 by 2030. It has become a legally binding objective of 27% renewables of our energy mix by 2030, a target which the heads of state is binding on the EU as a whole, but not the member states. And thirdly, we have a target of 20%, 27% energy efficiency, with a view to achieving 30% that the council has said will not be based on nationally binding targets. Okay, so this takes us into uncharted waters. This takes us into a new level of challenge because moving from 20% renewable energy, okay, which gives 35% renewable electricity to 27% renewable energy takes us to 55% percent of our electricity system. To achieve 27 stroke 30 percent uh, energy efficiency means we will have to make enormous changes to the way that we heat and cool our buildings. So these are huge challenges. So the real challenge of our next energy policy is to implement this 40, 27, 27 stroke 30 targets in a different way than the way we have before. If we cannot achieve the 40, 27, 27 stroke 30 in a way that meets this energy triangle perfectly, that ensures competitiveness, security, as well as sustainability, will we inspire others to act? Will we inspire countries such as the United States to deal with climate change? If we don't achieve the 40, 27, 27 stroke 30 in a way that meets this triangle, will we retain the support of European citizens for this energy revolution? And all of the people know in this room the way in which electricity and gas bills have gone up in Spain and that it does cause people to look at it with concern. So if we wish to inspire others, and if we wish to ensure the continued support of our citizens 
for our energy revolution, for the decarbonisation of our energy system. This has to be done. And let's face it, if we are to achieve what our longer-term objectives are of 80 to 90 percent cut in CO2, we have to lay the bad bedrock now, and this has to be a competitive and efficient bedrock. Because we're saying we're going to do 80 percent, 90 percent cut in CO2 by 2050. Just do the maths. This means by 2050, zero carbon electricity. It means zero carbon transport, and it means zero carbon buildings. Otherwise, the numbers just don't add up. The remaining 10 to 20% is going to be used in agriculture, it's going to be used in aviation, and it's going to be used in maritime and things like this. So laying the bedrock now in a competitive and efficient way is fundamental to what we need to achieve. So let's agree that this is the heart of our objectives and then try and unpick the challenges that we need to do and see whether the winter package, the new legislation, puts us on course to meet these challenges. Okay? So let's try and agree what are our key headline challenges. Okay? The first challenge that I have is to get the cost of renewables down. Ensure that renewables becomes an efficient and competitive source of generation without the need for subsidies greater than emissions trading system that competes on a level playing field to create an electricity market that is an energy-only market based on the ETS. That's where we have to be. We have to have a revolution in cost-effective energy efficiency, which creates jobs here. And that's the great thing about energy efficiency. Energy efficiency does not export jobs. Energy efficiency is about refurbishing buildings, it's about glass, it's about insulation materials. None of these transport well. That's the good news. It is about completing the internal market so that all may benefit. My comments in relation to um, Iberia. It is about security. It is about ensuring that we continue to have a diverse and effective source of gas supplies. And increasingly, it's going to be about cyber security. As our electricity market fundamentally changes, so that distribution systems become more and more an integral and more important part of our market, the challenge of cyber security, and many of you may not know, um, but a couple of years ago, the Ukraine system went down due to a cyber attack. And so this is not pure imaginings. Cyber security will be an issue for our electricity system. And to reform the um, ETS. So, let us see how the winter package addresses these challenges and to see whether or not the winter package puts us on course in order to achieve what I've said. So, the first, in relation to renewable energy, the winter package has accepted there will be no legally binding targets per member state. In 2009, we have individual legally binding targets that member states must meet and member states are meeting. But the heads of state have decided that for 27% target, there will be no such legally binding targets. There will be more flexibility amongst the different member states to achieve it. So there goes the question at the end of the day. If you have a 20% legally binding target at the European level, but you do not have it at national member state level, how will this work? Will member states really step up and meet their part of the bargain, if you like? And this is where a side part of the proposal comes in, which is the European governance mechanism of the energy union package, whereby each member state will submit to the European Commission their national energy and climate action plans. Each member state will determine themselves how they are going to con contribute to the EU's headline goals, the 40, 27, 27 stroke 30. And in 2018, the member states will put forward their first draft proposal for the period 2021 until 2030. The Commission will put these together and will determine how far or how far or how close we are to our overall objectives and then we will determine what needs to be done, if anything. So the renewables objectives 
are deeply bound with the governance requirements. But equally important in the Renewables Directive, you see a real shift to bringing renewable electricity into the standard electricity market. There is an end to priority dispatch, with the exception of uh, households, for example, um, and there are general rules for support schemes that, at least at the non-household level, they have to be determined by a competitive process, pushing down costs, increasing efficiency. In terms of energy efficiency, this will be a difficult one because the member states agreed at the European Council that there would not be any legally binding target on the European Union or on the individual member states. The Commission has proposed that there should be a legally binding 30% target. And they have proposed the continuation of Article 7, which requires member states to deliver 1.5% improvement on energy efficiency a year getting us up to 15% improvement by 2020, which is de facto a form of legally binding obligation on each member state. There is also an improvement of the Buildings Directive and a major financing initiative. This is terribly important, this energy efficiency proposal. I know it will be contentious, I know it will be difficult, but if Europe does not invest in cost-effective energy efficiency, the EU is proposing, the Commission is proposing, that we take the measures that make industry more competitive, that make citizens richer, and create jobs at home. This should be one of the focus of our efforts. And now I come to market design, the most difficult and the most complex, which at the end of the day has the objective of making the electricity market what I would call fit for purpose. You all know quite how much the increase of renewable electricity from about 12% in 2009 to 23% today to 35% in 2020 to 55% in 2030 will completely change our market. And our electricity system, our regulatory system, has to be fit for purpose. So we have taken a whole series of measures in order to bring this forward. Let me just highlight some of these measures. Firstly, we are requiring that when member states determine whether or not they need capacity mechanisms, whether or not they need to tender for additional capacity, this adequacy assessment is no longer done at a national level that this is done at a regional level in order to re-Europeanize re a market that was becoming nationalized. This is no doubt difficult because member states, in some cases, have been used to taking purely national adequacy mechanisms without taking account of whether there is adequate spare capacity in their neighboring markets and then tendering just nationally for that capacity. This cannot be a part of a European internal market. So it requires that capacity assessments, adequacy assessments, are done at a regional level through regional cooperation, and capacity mechanisms, where they are really necessary, are permitted, but permitted subject to conditions that they are competitive and that they are non-national, and that they are not coal at the end of the day, that there are minimum efficiency, 50 parts, 500 parts per million standards, which basically takes coal, coal generation, outside of the capacity mechanism area. This will be highly contentious, of course, but it is the start of a recognition that where we are today of burning more coal in order to save CO2 is a contradiction in say. There are measures in order to limit and remove wholesale price caps in order for clear price indications to be given to scarcity. This is very, very important when you have a greater level of intermittency in your electricity markets. The priority dispatch for renewable energy is ended except for households. There will be better demand management. So demand response 
will be allowed and ensured to play its full role in terms of dealing with intermittent generation as any other capacity mechanism. There are provisions to ensure that we reinvest congestion rents back into the grid. There is a greater role for distribution system operators recognizing the change in the topography of the grid as more renewable energy is invested at the distribution level. There is better information to consumers and new rules on risk preparedness. These are highlights. They are not the, complex, the totality of the package, but they do explain, I think, one thing. I think they show that with this winter package on renewable energy, on governance, on energy efficiency, and on market design, put the European Union into a place by which it is perfectly possible to reorientate our policy back completely into the triangle that I mentioned. It's perfectly possible. It sets the foundations to do so. It does not, however, in say, guarantee that this will be done. This will require a huge amount of additional work by regulators, by the Commission, and above all, by member states, which are going to be implementing this package in great detail. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the market design proposal does put the European market in a position that it would be future-proofed, that it would be leading, a global leader, in terms of the change in the grids that we have to expect will happen in all parts of the world as we move to decarbonisation, and will do so in a competitive and efficient way. Thank you very much. Thank you.